Welcome to Jeremy's IT Lab. This is a complete course for the CCNP NCORE, Enterprise Core exam. In this video, we'll continue our study of spanning tree protocol by looking at PortFast, BPDU Guard, and BPDU Filter. Here's what we'll cover in this video. We're covering three optional features from the STP toolkit. The first one is PortFast, which allows ports to immediately transition to the forwarding state without the listening and learning states. Then we'll cover BPDU Guard and BPDU Filter, which both control how the switch reacts to BPDUs on PortFast enabled ports. Let's get started with PortFast. Of course, you should already know PortFast from your CCNA studies. So let's do a quick review of PortFast and then look at some more details that you might not have learned while studying for the CCNA. Details that I didn't cover in my CCNA course, for example. STP-enabled ports normally take 30 seconds to enter the forwarding state after being enabled. Here it is in debug output. After initially entering the listening state, 15 seconds later, the port moves to learning, and then another 15 seconds later to forwarding. This delay can be frustrating for users, who aren't able to access the network for 30 seconds. And ports connected to end hosts don't pose a risk of causing layer 2 loops, so the delay is unnecessary. There's no need to wait to determine the STP topology before moving the ports to the forwarding state. PortFast allows a port to immediately transition to the forwarding state upon being connected or enabled, bypassing listening and learning. With PortFast enabled, the port jumps straight to forwarding, as you can see in this output. Now let's look at how to configure PortFast. There are two main ways. First is configuring it on a per port basis in interface config mode. The command is spanning tree portfast. After enabling it, you'll see this warning message telling you that portfast can cause temporary bridging loops, meaning layer two switching loops, because it moves ports immediately to forwarding. It also states that portfast will only take effect when the port is in a non-trunking mode, meaning when it's an access port. Later, we'll see how to activate PortFast on trunk ports too. Okay, the other option for configuring PortFast is globally, from global config mode. You can configure it with spanning tree PortFast default. And here's the warning message shown this time. Note that it says that this command enables PortFast by default on all interfaces. Actually, it will only be active on access ports, not trunk ports. So if I use this command on switch 1 and switch 2 in this network, PortFast will not be activated on these trunk ports connecting the switches, but will be activated on these access ports connected to PCs. And here's one more command, spanning tree PortFast disable. You can use this command to disable PortFast on specific access ports if needed after you enable it by default. Typically, you don't connect switches together with access ports, so you won't need to disable PortFast on any access ports, but in rare cases you might. So you should be aware of the command. Now let's look at something called PortFast Edge, which is just PortFast with a different name. On some platforms, such as iOS XE, which is used by the Catalyst 9K series of switches, for example, among others, and also iOS VL2, which is used in CML, using the spanning tree PortFast command, we'll apply the spanning tree PortFast Edge command instead. Let me demonstrate. On switch 1, which is an iOS VL2 switch running in CML, I issued the spanning tree portfast command. But in the running config, it is converted to spanning tree portfast edge. Here's a useful show command, show spanning tree interface detail. Notice the highlighted output. The port is in portfast edge mode. And take a look at the three options for the portfast command, disable, edge, and network. We know that disable turns off portfast when spanning tree portfast default is configured. So what exactly are portfast edge and portfast network? Spanning tree portfast edge is regular portfast, the kind we covered in the CCNA and are covering in this video. It was just renamed to portfast edge because it's meant for use on edge ports connected to end hosts. Spanning tree portfast network is used with a feature called bridge assurance that can be used with Rapid PVST+. I may cover bridge assurance later when we look at Rapid Spanning Tree. 
And by the way, when configuring portfast default, you'll notice something similar. Portfast default is changed to portfast edge default. You can use either command. The effect is the same. The device will change it to the edge command in the config. Now let's look at portfast on trunk ports. Portfast is usually configured on access ports connected to end hosts. The spanning tree portfast command works on trunk ports, but doesn't activate portfast unless the port becomes an access port. Portfast won't be active while it's in trunk mode. And spanning tree portfast default also doesn't activate portfast on trunk ports. However, some end hosts connect to trunk ports, such as servers running virtual machines. Here's an example I showed back in the VLANs video. It's common for servers like this to connect to the switch via a trunk because the VMs are in separate VLANs. So how can we enable portfast on trunks? You can use spanning tree portfast trunk or spanning tree portfast edge trunk if you're using a device that runs iOS XE, for example. I used the command on this iOS VL2 switch specifying edge in the command, although that is optional. It works with or without the edge keyword. I then confirmed and notice that it says the port is in portfast edge trunk mode. So that's how to activate portfast on trunks. Just add the trunk keyword. Note that there is no default command, like spanning tree portfast default trunk. You must configure it directly on the interface. By the way, can you think of one more situation where a switch's trunk port connects to a device that isn't a switch? How about router on a stick? That's another situation where you could use this command to activate portfast on the trunk connecting to the router, allowing it to immediately start forwarding. Okay, let's cover one more aspect of portfast, how portfast handles BPDUs. A common misconception is that portfast basically disables STP on the port, stopping it from sending BPDUs and also making it ignore BPDUs it receives. This is not true. Portfast does not disable STP on the port. The switch still sends BPDUs out of the port. And if the switch receives a BPDU on a portfast enabled port, it will disable portfast and operate like a regular STP port. So if portfast causes a loop, it should only be temporary. The switch should receive a BPDU from the other switch and then block the portfast port if necessary. In other words, the loop should be a maximum of two seconds until a BPDU is received. However, temporary loops are still a big problem. It doesn't take long for a layer two loop to bring down a LAN. So you should be careful with portfast. Now let's see what happens when a portfast enabled port receives a BPDU. I configure portfast on switch one's G01 port connected to a PC. Notice that switch one G01 still sends BPDUs even though portfast is configured. It has sent 19 BPDUs, but received zero, as expected. It's connected to a PC. I used show spanning tree interface G01 port fast to check if port fast is enabled, and indeed it is. So this output confirms that port fast enabled ports still send BPDUs. What if we connect G01 to another switch instead? So switch one G01 starts receiving BPDUs. As you can see when I used this command, switch one had received two BPDUs on its G01 port. And notice that portfast is now disabled on G01. However, portfast is still present in G01's configuration. It was just deactivated. So to summarize, portfast doesn't disable STP on ports. The port still sends BPDUs. And if a BPDU is received on a portfast enabled port, portfast will be disabled and the port will operate like a regular STP port. Okay, that's enough about portfast. Let's move on to the second topic, BPDU guard. Portfast should only be enabled on ports connected to non-switch devices, like end hosts and routers, devices that don't send BPDUs. Basically, if a portfast enabled port receives a BPDU, someone messed up. If an end user carelessly connects a switch to a port, it could affect the STP topology. For example, if the switch becomes the new root bridge, that will affect the entire STP topology. Here's an example situation where something like that could happen. Bob from the accounting department connects his PC to the wall jack in his office, 
which connects to Switch 1's G01 port. His wall jack only has one port, but perhaps he wants to connect some more of his devices to the LAN. So he decides to take things into his own hands. So Bob connects his own switch to the wall jack, and then connects his PC, laptop, and perhaps other devices to his switch. Here's the problem. Bob's switch becomes the root bridge, changing switch 1's root and designated ports, and then the rest of the STP topology too, which isn't shown in this diagram. Here's where BPDU Guard comes in. BPDU Guard can protect against unauthorized switches being connected to ports intended for end hosts. BPDU Guard can be configured separately from PortFast, but usually both features are used together. It's recommended that you activate both on ports connected to end hosts or routers. Here's a common misconception. BPDU Guard enabled ports continue to send BPDUs. It doesn't disable BPDUs on the port. But if a BPDU Guard enabled port receives a BPDU, it enters the error disabled state, effectively shutting down the port. Here's how to configure BPDU Guard. Like PortFast, there are two main ways to configure BPDU Guard. First, you can configure it on a per port basis. The command is spanning tree BPDU Guard enable in interface config mode. Show spanning tree interface detail confirms that BPDU Guard is enabled. The second way is to enable BPDU Guard globally, enabling it by default. The command is spanning tree port fast BPDU Guard default in global config mode. Depending on the platform, that command might become spanning tree port fast edge BPDU Guard default in the configuration. Once again, this output confirms that BPDU Guard is enabled. Note that when enabled by default, BPDU Guard will only be activated on port fast enabled ports. That's because these features are usually used together. You probably aren't going to use only one of them. Now let's look at the concept of air disable and how a port can recover after being disabled by BPDU guard. As mentioned before, if a BPDU guard enabled port receives a BPDU, the port enters the error disabled state. This output shows two messages. Received BPDU on port G01 with BPDU guard enabled, disabling port and BPDU guard error detected on G01, putting G01 in air disable state. You can confirm with show interface. As you can see here, G01 is air disabled. As a side note, you can use show air disable detect to view which causes air disable detection is enabled for. It's enabled for all causes by default, meaning if any of these events occur, the port will be air disabled. Here's the output on switch one. Notice it is enabled for BPDU guard. If a BPDU guard enabled port receives a BPDU, it will be error disabled. You can use no error disable detect cause, followed by the cause name, to disable the feature for a particular cause. But note that it doesn't work for all causes. For example, error disable can't be disabled for BPDU guard, because the entire point of BPDU guard is to disable ports that receive BPDUs. However, you can use the command air disable detect cause BPDU guard shutdown VLAN, which makes BPDU guard shut down only the offending VLAN on the port, the VLAN in which the BPDU was received, instead of shutting down the entire port. So in other words, it blocks only the specific VLAN, not the entire port. The port itself will remain up. This could make a difference on a BPDU guard enabled trunk port with multiple VLANs, allowing more granular control over how BPDU guard behaves. But in general, I don't think you'll be using this command. The default mode is usually what you want. Now let's see how an air disabled port can recover. There are two ways. The first is that you can disconnect the offending switch and then use shutdown and no shutdown to reset the disabled port. That's the manual method. The second option is to do it automatically with a feature called air disable recovery. Use show air disable recovery to view the status of it on the switch. Unlike the air disable feature itself, air disable recovery is disabled for all causes by default. You have to manually enable it. The default recovery timer is five minutes. This means that every five minutes, the switch will attempt to re-enable ports that have been air disabled, if air disable recovery is enabled for the specific cause. And you can change the interval with air disable recovery interval. 
So I enabled Air Disable Recovery for the BPDU Guard cause with Air Disable Recovery cause BPDU Guard. As you can see, it is now enabled. So I once again made Switch 1's G01 port become air disabled by BPDU Guard. Now you can see G01 down here in the output of Show Air Disable Recovery. In 290 seconds, it will be re enabled automatically. And that's what happened, five minutes after it was air disabled. It says, attempting to recover from BPDU Guard air disable state on G01. However, it was immediately air disabled again. That's because I didn't actually remove the offending switch that sent BPDUs to switch 1. Make sure to fix the issue that resulted in the port being air disabled, or it will simply be disabled again after recovering. Okay, so that's BPDU Guard. It's usually used together with PortFast on ports connected only to end hosts. If a switch is connected to the port and a BPDU is received, the port will be air disabled. Finally, let's cover BPDU filter. We will just take a quick look at it because this is a protocol that most people do not recommend. BPDU filter blocks ports from sending BPDUs. But unlike BPDU guard, it does not disable a port if a BPDU is received. Exactly what it does when a BPDU is received depends on how you configure it. Like PortFast and BPDU Guard, BPDU Filter can be enabled per port or globally. To configure it per port, use the Spanning Tree BPDU Filter Enable command in Interface Config mode. It will then appear in the output of Show Spanning Tree Interface Detail like this. BPDU Filter is enabled. To enable it globally, use Spanning Tree PortFast BPDU Filter default. Now here's the key. BPDU filter behaves differently if you enable it per port or globally. If you enable it per port, the port will not send BPDUs and will ignore any BPDUs it receives, effectively disabling STP on the port. It won't participate at all. If you enable it globally, BPDU filter will be activated on all port fast enabled ports, just like when you enable BPDU guard globally. The port will not send BPDUs, except a few when the interface starts up. But here's the main difference. If the port receives a BPDU, PortFast and BPDU filter are disabled, and the port operates as a normal STP port. Remember that difference. Enabling it directly in interface config mode basically disables STP on the port. Enabling it globally does the same, but if a BPDU is received, it reverts to being a normal STP port. So BPDU filter is useful for disabling STP on a port and no bandwidth is wasted by sending BPDUs. But it's generally not recommended. Especially when it's enabled per port in interface config mode, it can easily cause loops. That's all we'll cover about BPDU filter. But before we finish, let's use it to cause a broadcast storm in my network, because breaking things is fun. So my normal setup is quite simple. A Catalyst 2960 switch that connects my PC and my router slash firewall. I added another switch, a Catalyst 3650, which I will connect to JITL switch 1. On switch 1's ports, I enabled both PortFast and BPDU filter. And then I did the same on switch 2. Here's some sample output of show interface G01 during normal circumstances. That's 8 million bits per second input, so 8 megabits per second. And it received 59 broadcast messages. With just one PC, there is very little traffic in the network. Now let's connect these four ports together. None of them are sending or receiving BPDUs, so they are all forwarding, and that means accumulating broadcast frames looping around between them. Here's show interface F01. Total output drops, that's 159 million, so it has dropped 159 million packets. Five minute input rate, that's 91 million bits per second. 91 megabits per second. So almost reaching the port's max capacity at the time I used this command. And look at the broadcasts count. Received 127 million broadcasts and 91 million multicasts. So even with just one PC and one firewall slash router, a broadcast storm very quickly began and made using the network nearly impossible. And it only got worse with time as more broadcast frames accumulated. The lesson here is, be careful about using BPDU filter, especially when enabling it directly in interface config mode.
Here's what we covered in this video. We covered three optional features from the STP toolkit. First was PortFast, which you should enable on all ports connected to non-switch devices. Then we covered BPDU Guard, which you should enable on PortFast enabled ports to protect against the possibility of switches being connected to those ports. And then we briefly looked at BPDU Filter, which stops ports from sending BPDUs and also from receiving them, although there is a difference in behavior if you enable it globally or per port. Okay, now let's go on to the quiz. Here's question one. Which feature or features should be enabled to make a port immediately move to the forwarding state, but become a regular STP port when it receives a BPDU? Pause the video now to think about the answer. Okay, the answer is A, port fast alone. It's port fast that makes the port immediately move to the forwarding state. If you enable BPDU Guard 2, it will not operate normally when it receives a BPDU. It will air disable the port. C is incorrect for a couple reasons. First, the question doesn't mention stopping the port from sending BPDUs, which is what BPDU Filter does. Also, if BPDU Filter is configured in interface config mode, the port won't become a regular STP port when it receives a BPDU. It will simply ignore the BPDU. So A, port fast, is a better answer. Okay, let's go to question two. You issue spanning tree port fast BPDU filter default on switch one. What happens when one of its port fast enabled ports receives a BPDU? Pause the video now to think about the answer. Okay, the answer is C. It disables port fast and BPDU filter on the port. When BPDU filter is globally enabled, it stops port fast enabled ports from sending BPDUs. But if a port receives a BPDU, it disables port fast and BPDU filter on the port, and then the port operates like a normal STP port. Okay, let's go to question three. Which of the following statements is true? There are four statements about the default state of air disable detection and recovery. Pause the video now to think about the answer. Okay, the answer is A. Air disable detection is enabled for all causes by default, and air disable recovery is disabled for all causes. That means if any relevant air disable events occur, the port will be air disabled, but won't automatically recover unless you enable air disable recovery for the specific cause. Okay, that's all for the quiz and this video. I hope it was helpful. Thanks for watching. Before finishing this video, let me thank my JCNP level channel members. To become a member, please click the join button under the video. Thanks to Yonatan Makara, Velva Jacob, George, Nasir Chowdhury, Gustavo Macedo, Marcel Lord, Pavel M, Dragos Hirnea, Zakib Shah, Mayor Salman, Vitaus194, Chance Carter56, Mark Jackson, Bold1C1U, Michael Carroll, Gerald Guiam, Fristas1207, Gabriel Braga, Hector Hernandez, Mara Tuba, Roji Kuriakos, Arpad Konives, Five Feet, Owad, Daniel Brown, Jose Alvarez, Hussein Yavuz, Kevin Hayes, Samuel Tavares, Roger Bratseth, Mustafa Ersoy, Nasser Zahar, Brian Grant, Georgi Gemijev, Hypocrisy Allergic, Arlen Plagaria, Dear Diso, Adelson Pereira, Farad69, Joyce Njoroge, Lucien Stoichetoyu, Madmark50484, Alexander Stratan, Hiago Bicalho, Pieter Kaimov, DMJ2, Kurt Nell, Omid Farakesh, Steve Cox, Jasper Yim, Wilmer Romero, Laurent Lamb, Pedro Hartman, Ivano Capuano, Enigma G, Jefferson Steelflex, Alejandro Okana, Burl Campbell, Abhishek Sahu, Toxic, Sinan Sarisinar, Gio, Daniel Andrade, Jairo Francisco, Mike Crumby, Eliel Eli Luli, Dragos George, VJ Kumar Pili, Filip Jovanovic, Andrew Krauska, Random User 7547, Wagner Botelho, ICTEDU Official, and Mateusz Wzeszynski. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, but thank you so much for your support. Thanks to you and my other supporters, I am able to make these videos and release them for free on YouTube, so I really appreciate the support. Another great way to support the channel is to like the video, leave a comment, subscribe, 
And most importantly, share this video with others. So if this video was helpful, I'd appreciate it if you did any of those. Thanks for watching. Thank you.